houses were painted, we still don't paint our neoclassical ones. Bankers also finance artists needing funds to complete their works, including Botticelli and Michelangelo, and city governments themselves were also important patrons of the Renaissance, while individual leaders often spent as much as 6% of their personal income on the arts. Why? Well, largely for the same reasons that rich people fund art and buildings today, for status, for recognition, and maybe even for the love of beauty. But also, funding public art in cathedrals and the like served to legitimize the wealth of those families. The church couldn't very well condemn merchant wealth if it was used to build churches nor could the governments that came to depend on that wealth. We see this again and again throughout history. Wealth supports institutions that in turn legitimize that wealth. Regardless, in these artworks, you can see the paradoxes of the Renaissance. Paganism is combined with Christianity, as it often had been throughout European Christian history. Profit-oriented bankers financed the church, which was run by priests who'd taken a vow of poverty and founded by a figure who, in the Gospels overturns the tables of moneylenders in the temple. Also, in these city-states, access to a more humanistic educational approach helped boost economic growth and fueled the creation of much art and architecture that is still really influential. Now, many city-states participated in this humanist revival, but its headquarters was undoubtedly Florence. Let's go to the thought bubble. Artists of the time were following ancient styles and taking them further. Visual artists like Sandro Botticelli and Michelangelo focused on human dignity and realistic details. Botticelli's portrait of Florentine citizens displayed the distinct features of his subjects, while his depictions of religious individuals show, for example, a plump infant Jesus realistically reaching for his mother's garments. Botticelli's portrait of the long dead Dante similarly displayed his long, thin, and pointed nose rather than than some idealized formulaic hero. And Michelangelo's David presents truly human characteristics even as it sought to copy ancient sculptural styles. Across the spectrum of Renaissance art, anatomical accuracy flourished, which you can see in Michelangelo's sculptures and also in the work of fellow Florentine Leonardo da Vinci. Both artists, incidentally, were able to render the human form in part because they both dissected cadavers. And nature, as a setting for humans, and thus humanism, was also glorified in Renaissance art, as you can see in The Birth of Venus. Botticelli's painting focuses on the mythical goddess from the classical world, but at the same time, she's about to be clothed in the flowers found in the natural world of the countryside. In short, the artists of the Renaissance focused on situating a realistically depicted human body in both its natural environment and its civic setting. Thanks, Thought Bubble. But amid this prosperity and cultural revival, Florentine history was marked by a succession of economic and natural shocks, class divisions, corporate rivalries, party struggles, conflicts with the church, and especially political crises. And those arose from threats of external invasion, but also from internal tyranny and discontent among the lower classes. Like Venice, Florence took great pride in being a republic, although it was a bit different from contemporary republics and exceedingly unstable. Like, there weren't really elections. Instead, names of members of Florence's guilds would basically be drawn out of a large leather bag. And if your name was drawn, you got to serve on the Signoria, which ran the city. And if you weren't psyched about the job, no worries, because new Signorias were chosen every two months, which might make it seem like a lot of people were able to participate in civic life. But one, in order to be a member of a guild, you needed to be debt-free and male and well-connected. And two, in truth, the lottery were often rigged with wealthy families tending to win places on the Signoria. Also, there were frequent coups and counter coups and the Republic would often cease to be Republican and at times become downright monarchical. It was all quite Game of Thronesy. One might even say that it was a bit Machiavellian. And no wonder, because the political theorist Niccolo Machiavelli did live in Florence. We'll discuss him more next week, but for now, it's important to know that he saw and suffered through much of this turmoil, including the rise and fall 
and rise again of the Medici family. The Medicis were tremendously powerful in Florence, although contrary to what you might read, they weren't the only important family in the Renaissance, but they did make huge sums of money in banking and investing, and they were important patrons to artists. In fact, Michelangelo carved one of their tombs. Cosimo Medici and his grandson Lorenzo dominated the second half of the 15th century in Florence, while successive members of the family perpetuated its power and patronage by serving as popes in the next centuries. Machiavelli argued that the Florentine Renaissance's golden age ended with the death of Lorenzo de' Medici in 1492 and the invasion of the barbarians. Of course, barbarians mostly means not us throughout history. In fact, the word itself comes from a feeling that the language of barbarians sounded like bar, 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 bar. Anyway, these particular barbarians were French, so I guess it sounded like bar. I wasn't very good in high school French. And so we return at last to the old question. Were there really broad shifts away from the religification of all aspects of European life toward the human and the secular in the Renaissance? Like, yes, Michelangelo sculpted David, but he also painted the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Perspective matters when you ask these questions. Something important and new was happening in 14th century Florence and Venice and Milan and so on among merchants and intellectuals, but the lives of average people, especially peasants, were not much transformed by this humanist thinking at least not in the short run. But in other ways, ordinary people did also have a renaissance. Ancient authors were translated into Italian and French, which allowed those without access to Latin to read Cicero and the like. But of course, most Italian peasants couldn't read anything. Historians also debate whether women experienced a renaissance. Women were among the patrons of the arts. Isabella d'Este sponsored musical events and loved Petrarch's poems so much she had music composed for them. She also sponsored painters, maintaining contacts with Leonardo da Vinci. But Isabella d'Este and her similarly accomplished sister Beatrice are often seen as the exception. In general, men, according to 15th century writer Laura Serretta, discounted women's intellectual worth. Deliberately following Petrarch's path as he had followed Cicero's, Serretta wrote a famous letter to one misogynist that read in part, I cannot tolerate your having attacked my entire sex. With just cause, I am moved to demonstrate how great a reputation for learning and virtue women have won by their inborn excellence manifested in every age as knowledge. Also, the rise of Roman legal thinking meant the rise of the paterfamilias, the idea that the father is the center of every family and also the center of power. All of which is to say that the Renaissance saw tremendously important developments in the intellectual and cultural life of Italian city-states, developments that would soon be exported to other communities. But we have to be able to shift perspectives. To the Medicis, the Renaissance was definitely a thing. To many peasants, it was not. We remember the Renaissance today partly because it's helpful for historians to periodize history to frame their analyses, and partly because so much Renaissance thinking shapes our thinking. And I think it's worth remembering how the ideas of the Renaissance continue to resonate for us today. I mean, consider, for example, the feeling that the current age is so full of corruption and destruction that we must return to the purity of some bygone era of greatness. That Renaissance thinking seems very relevant indeed. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Thanks so much for watching Crash Course European History, which is filmed here in Indianapolis and produced with the help of all of these. There we go. Okay, so let's think again about these video questions and I want to talk about them a little bit. The first question, talking about how wealth was used during Renaissance Italy. Can anyone give me an example of this, of how this is used? Alex, go ahead. Okay, so we have sponsored um, merchants specifically sponsoring these civic events 
as well as paying for upkeep. One of the big points of the video and what John Green talks about and what we are going to see is this circle of wealthy individuals paying for institutions that would condemn them, right? So um, how are you going to stand and preach against a, a group of individuals that are literally paying you to be there or paying for your church to be built or paying for what have you? You can't, well, you could, but this time period allowed these wealthy merchant classes, wealthy individual class to pay for them to no longer be at a lower level in society. They helped move their social status up by supporting these institutions. Right? That is one way. Okay? We also see these wealthy individuals essentially paying to become politicians, to become powerful politicians, be involved in the government. He gives the example of the Medici family. Right? They are that family in Florence. We're going to talk about them specifically, especially when we start looking at Machiavelli. But that's another example of how wealth is impacting political gain. We have the economy, we have trade, right? And we're gonna look at Italy's geography and see why, but that aspect of trade bringing in that much wealth allowed for the Renaissance to become so widespread, allowed for it to gain so much speed and all that um, influence because of the finances of the time period. Now there is that little what about the peasantry? What about that lower class individuals that they have a renaissance? But those are the main aspects of this. I also want you guys to think about those examples of the renaissance. So I gave you a couple. Like I said, I want you guys to give me two examples. You can use one of these examples I provided, but I would like you to think of another on your own. I thought of a couple off the top of my head. I know that a lot of times historical TV shows or even... Um, I think you're going to see a lot more Leonardo da Vinci than any of these other guys. Da Vinci's in uh, Futurama. Da Vinci's in um, what? Me, Mr. Peabody. He's in Family Guy. Like he's in a lot of pop culture things. They have the Da Vinci Code. They have all these things. Um, we also are going to see other aspects. Um, I'm thinking of one of his famous paintings. Can anyone tell me what it is? The Mona Lisa. How many of you guys haven't heard of the Mona Lisa? None, right? It's very popular. Uh, I think Chance the Rapper came out with a song a couple of years ago that used the Last Supper painting as the cover art. Things like that. All of these things are from the Renaissance period that we see in our lives today. Okay? Yeah, there we go. 